This podcast is brought to you in part by Sing and Dog Double Read Supply. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Please visit www.singandog.com to see all of their products. That's S-I-N-G-I-N-D-O-G.com. This episode is sponsored in part by MKL Reads. MKL is the one-stop shop for handmade oboe reeds where you can try reeds from various makers and select the one that is best for you. Visit mklreads.com and enter coupon code DOUBLEREADDISH for free shipping on your first order. That's coupon code DOUBLE SPACE READ SPACE DISH, all caps, for free shipping on your first order. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson, and you're listening to Double Read Dish a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 16 of Double Read Dish. Galit, how are you? I am awesome. How are you? I'm good. We are recording this early morning. We just got done recording an interview overseas with Ula Christian oh. Dahl. Oh, my goodness. So it necessitated work waking up uh, early, even a little early for me. Just say it. Just say what time you woke up. I woke up at 4.30 a.m., <laughs> which is not like – totally rare for me but usually it happens organically and this morning it was like my alarm was blaring into my head and I was very nervous because it's our first overseas interview yeah and so I was really nervous about the technology really hoping everything would work and everything went off without a hitch cannot wait to release episode 17 now wow this interview was I don't know. Would you say three flame emojis or four? I gotta get it five flames. Five. Five, five flames. flames. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the whole time I was like, Oh man, I wanna practice I wanna go practice that. Oh, I'm gonna go practice that. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go practice it was so good. He was so smart and personable and friendly and oh I loved it. But now it's over and my adrenaline is coming down, so now I'm like that emoji with like one big eye and one little eye. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> oh, it's all right. We can do it. But yeah, I have a whole day of summer camp. We're doing a chamber music and orchestral institute. It's a week long sleepover camp here at Southeast. I have three bassoons, which is super awesome. Fun. Yes, we're doing read class. We're doing bassoon trio, and then I've are got they it. learning? Oh, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm so curious. Are they learning how to make reads from scratch? Not from scratch. We're doing gouge shape profiled, and they're starting from there. Um, but they're doing great. They're really fast learners. And I've got a quartet doing uh, Rossini quartet, the flute, no oboes. So it's flute, clarinet, oh. bassoon horn. Um, and yeah, it's super fun and great way. You know, I was enjoying my summer break, but it's nice to kind of come back and get back to work and work with um, students who went take a week of my summer and play chamber music. Yeah, that sounds fun. You know, they're all great students who are really enthusiastic and eager. So I'm loving it. That's awesome. That sounds great. I'm actually um, visiting family in Michigan. So it's been lovely. It's cool. It's calm. It's quiet. The ants here don't like bite. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's been great. It's been really great. Yeah, just some summer chill time. Yeah, I love chill time. So um, for our dish this episode, we were thinking of talking about, like, our summer memories of jobs, perhaps our most memorable slash terrible summer jobs that we've ever had. Um, I'm very curious to know yours. Yeah, well, I I thought of this because – I was so enjoying my lazy summer now that I'm faculty, but um, I don't know about you or probably a lot of our listeners, 
traditional part-time jobs don't work so well when you're a music student. You know, bosses don't always understand rehearsals and concerts, and you want to have practice time. And so um, I had to spend a lot of my summers as a student making the money that would get me through the next academic year, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so summers were like work, 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 and it was... W-O-R-K or W-E-R-K? O-R-K. (laughs) (laughs) because you had to find whatever job was okay with just seasonal work you know which were usually not the greatest entry level entry level yes so (laughs) two came to my mind when I was thinking about worst summer jobs the first was my first job actually I worked for Victoria's Secret um which sounds like it could be an exciting job but it was not I it served my very introverted nature I was a stock girl but so it was like eight hour shifts of just putting those sensor buttons on garment after garment after garment (laughs) it was just like put a sensor in, put a sensor in. And, uh, you know, I didn't even have an iPod at the time. This was before smartphones. So it was just silence for eight hours. Um, And then they have these, um, at that store, it's table-based, right? It's not hanger-based as much. And so you would spend all this time sorting the product by size and color and style and making these tables nice and neat. And then an hour into the workday, you know, some toddler comes in and, woo! like throwing all your work around and it was oh it was so so difficult I'm sorry and my last job before I got my uh faculty position my first faculty position um was at a daycare because remember I was a live-in nanny for three years and so I had child care experience um and it was at, um, yeah, a summer daycare that they needed some subs and some backup help. And it was fine. But, you know, daycares, it's hard because it's working parents. And so they can't always afford to stay home with their kids if they're sick. And so it was just a petri dish of <laughs> germs and guck and goo. And I was in one of the rooms that they were on the verge of potty trained, which meant multiple accidents every day. And yeah, I was sick all summer. My fan, my uh, husband was sick all summer and it was just, you know, I'll try to remember that. And everyone who's slogging through horrible summer job, all you students right now, it gets better. Someday you will have (laughs) salaried position one way or another, and, you know, I'm glad to not be there anymore, but but you can do it. You can do it. Um, Did you – so I don't know if I told you, but when I took my year off between uh, my master's degree and my doctorate, I taught preschool for a year. I didn't know that, no. Yeah. So – and I was also in the room with the um, twos turning three, so it was also like – the potty training year, and, uh, man, I feel you. I feel you. That was really intense. I think that year was why I don't have children. Right. <laughs> I mean, I love them. I loved them so much, but they're hard. It's really hard. Props to all the parents out there, 100%. Yes, I definitely like working with students that I can communicate with effectively. <laughs> students who can talk. Um, so one summer job that I had, um, was, uh, working in the music library at Florida State when I was a doctoral student. And it was also, it was a really good summer job because it was quiet and it was calm and you had your job and, you know, I would just like alternate between shelving books and being at the desk. And I just remember, um, the shelving shifts were the hardest shifts because like you were saying like eight hours of silence. I mean, it was definitely not eight hours. It was probably like two hours at a time, but you know, at first we were able to like stick our earbuds in and listen to podcasts or music or whatever, but then uh, they decided that it was, and probably rightly so like rude <laughs> for the <laughs> library worker to just be completely ignoring all of the patients, not the patients, the uh, patrons in the library and just like shelving and not answering anybody's questions. (laughs) So 
so they told us we couldn't do that anymore. And those were the longest <laughs> shifts of like just checking all the call numbers and reshelving books and making sure that everything was in the correct order. And woof, that, wow. See, that sounds like a fun job to me. I love being in a library. That's like one of my favorite places to be. But I guess it would be different if you were just looking at call numbers, not looking for the next book to read, but just right. examining <laughs> in order. <laughs> I really was not the model library employee. Actually, in high school, I worked at my um, my town library, and I got fired. <laughs> How did you get fired from a library? Well, I think it was because I was in high school and um, I could work like <laughs> my availability was like two hours one day a week. <laughs> yeah, see, it's hard for musicians to work during the academic year or the season, concert season. Yeah, and they were like, you know what, this really isn't working out. And I was like, am I getting fired? Like, type A, like, <laughs> all college prep class track student, like, are you firing me? <laughs> and they're like, you can not, you just can't ever work. And I was like, I know, but I'm really busy. And they're like, it's fine. I was like, okay. <laughs> it was so sad. Uh, you know, the other fun thing about summer is it gives you a little bit extra time uh, to maybe, you know, watch that movie or that show or just take some time to yourself. So what summer guilty pleasures do you indulge in? Well, first of all, if I can help it, I don't leave my house. My cool, air-conditioned, dark, comfortable house. <laughs> I will stay inside as much as humanly possible. Um, I'm not really like a summer weather person, um, my wife makes fun of me all the time because, you know, people usually like going to the beach, but I'll be like, uh, I don't really like sand <laughs> or heat or the sun. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I stay inside as much as I can. And uh, I will watch as much trash TV as I can fit in a day and still get all the things on my to-do list done. Well, same, but I am a very cold-blooded person, naturally. And so summers are hard for me because Missouri is hot and people mm -hmm. just blast, including my husband, just blast the air conditioning. <laughs> and I'm like, it's colder than it is in winter. And so my summer and guilty pleasure is being in my pajamas, you know, head to toe in fleece, maybe a robe as well for a disproportionate and probably inappropriate <laughs> amount of the day. I feel like we should, because I've gotten selfies of you while you're in this get up and I feel like we should be more specific in that every single one of Jackie's fleeces is leopard print. It's true. And also my seat strap is leopard print. My <laughs> slippers, my pajamas, everything. I'm a big fan of leopard print. So at least you're doing it in style. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So last episode, we put out a call for shout outs. And this episode, we got a great one from Brett Pimentel, who teaches reads at Delta State University in Mississippi. Shout out Mississippi. And uh, we think this will be a really great resource for all of uh, the teachers out there who teach multiple reads. Yeah, I know. I'm looking forward to using this as a resource in my double read tech class, and I'm always looking for more resources in that. If you have a shout out that you would like to hear on Double Read Dish, you can record it as a voice memo on your smartphone or on any other recording device. Keep it no longer than four minutes and send it over to Double Read Dish at gmail.com. We want to know what books you're reading, uh, what recordings you're listening to, what documentaries you're watching, anything that inspires you we want to make sure our listeners get to hear about. Without further ado, here's Brett. Hi, everybody. This is Brett Pimentel. I'm a woodwind player, and I teach uh, oboe and bassoon, plus some less important woodwinds at Delta State University in Mississippi. I've been a listener and fan of Double Read Dish since episode one. Uh, I hope it's okay if I shout out something of mine. Uh, I have a new book out called Woodwind Basics, Core Concepts for Playing and Teaching Flute, Oboe, Clarinet, Bassoon, and Saxophone. 
Uh, I wrote it to use with my university woodwind methods classes, but I think it's also useful for woodwind players and teachers at any level, uh, for woodwind doublers, uh, for school band directors, really for anyone who needs to understand the fundamental techniques that underlie good woodwind playing. Uh, anyway, I'm really excited about it, and I hope that you'll check it out. Uh, thanks, Galit and Jackie, and thanks, everybody. Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality and service in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on at Genda Industries. Did you know you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall is like a farmer's market filled with talented local regional reed makers selling their reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. Who knows? One day they may be your reeds for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, all capital letters, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and read tool roll. Visit them at gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're much more than just read knives. Dedicated to providing excellent handmade oboe and bassoon reeds to discriminating double reed players of all ages and abilities, Double or Nothing Reeds has recently expanded to sell double reed tools and supplies, gift items, and more. This includes knives, knife blades, thread, staples, cane, bags, and resources for students. As authorized Fox and Yamaha dealers, they offer an extensive range of oboes and bassoons for all levels. In addition, they sell quality used instruments on consignment. If you're looking for private oboe lessons but can't find anyone nearby, Double or Nothing Reads offers oboe lessons via Skype. Visit doubleornothingreads.com for good quality and affordable reed making supplies and accessories, lessons, instruments, and much more. That's doubleornothingreads.com. We are so excited to welcome to the show Claire Brazo, Principal Oboe of the LA Chamber Orchestra. Welcome, Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. Could we start off by having you tell us how you came to play the wonderful instrument that is the oboe? Sure. <laughs> um, so, like a lot of musicians, I was lucky to start on the piano because I remember seeing the jazz pianist Ray Charles play on Sesame Street, and I was totally sold. Um, and then in junior high, like any music nerd, I wanted to join the school band to be able to play with my friends. I, by that point, my parents had brought me to a few orchestra and ballet concerts, and I remember having the sound of the oboe stuck in my ear. I knew what it was, and I was attracted to it. And then I remember they told me that it was a very challenging instrument, so I guess that sealed the deal for me. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I continue to study piano very seriously. I was very competitive with it. Um, I loved it, but the oboe was this new and very fun outlet for me. It was more social. Uh, in high school, I was accepted to study at the Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan as a piano major, uh, but halfway through my time there, I decided to put more of my efforts into the oboe. I guess I, I realized that the oboe was a better fit for my personality. I love playing with with others. Um, I love focusing on one melodic line and obsessing over how to make it sing and how to make it fit into the rest of the musical framework. And I guess, yeah, by the end of high school, I was definitely passionate about music, uh, but I wasn't 100% sure that I wanted to make a career out of it. I guess, yeah, I wanted to explore other fields. So... Fortunately, I was accepted into the inaugural class of the Bard College and Conservatory double degree program. Um, it was a five-year program where all of the conservatory students, you know, we were required to get a Bachelor of Music in addition to a Bachelor of Arts in the college. Uh, my major was in Asian Studies. Um, it was definitely a challenge for me, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was the perfect supportive learning environment for me. And I 
was really lucky to have some amazing teachers who were all supportive of the double degree program. Laura Albeck was my primary teacher, and I would make trips into Juilliard uh, to study with Elaine DuVos occasionally, and she joined the faculty in my last year there. Um, I arranged my five years there pretty much so that by my fifth year, I had gotten most of my course heavy coursework out of the way. So in that last year, I really focused on oboe, and I focused on auditioning for graduate school programs. Um, so I was accepted to the Colburn School in Los Angeles to study with Alan Vogel for a three-year artist diploma. And in my last year of school there, I won the audition for second chair oboe in the LA Chamber Orchestra. So it was a great transition from being a student to being a professional, and it has led me to a lot of opportunities. I, I've gotten to record in the studios for TV and movie soundtracks. I've gotten solo and chamber music engagements. Basically, I feel like LA has been very good to me. <laughs> I have so many questions, but the most pressing question in my mind at this very moment is what TV shows and movies can we hear you in? <laughs> um the one I was super excited about last year was this little part I got called for. I didn't know what it was for when I was called in for it. Because a lot of times you get the call, you, you show up, and then you're like, oh, here's the music, go. <laughs> it's really, like, <laughs> exciting. Um, I, I have a small part in the third season of Mozart in the Jungle. <laughs> oh, that is iconic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> Um, um, so going back to perhaps a more traditional question, um, how would you describe your transition from a heavily academic environment at Bard to a very performance heavy program at Colburn? Well, both schools are incredibly invigorating and intense and amazing places to learn. But beyond that, yeah, they are super different. Um, I went from being around student philosophers and scientists to being surrounded by about 100 students who are all, most of them, practicing for orchestra auditions. So for me at that point in my development, it was perfect to have that kind of focus. Um, I finally had the time to really put all of my effort into oboe, and it felt great. Uh, I signed up for as much chamber music as I could. I think the school is a great chamber music program I, and so with such awesome students to work with. Um, I, I think I had chamber music coachings with pretty much all of the faculty members. We think about, um, you know, music education in college, and a lot of times it does harp on this idea of intensity, intensity, intensity. Um, and as someone who chose to go into a liberal arts environment and double major, even though you knew you were serious about pursuing the oboe at that point, do you feel like um, that has informed you as a musician or I guess more simply, what did you feel like you gained from having that um, experience in college? I think it was great for me to explore my other interests. You know, they, they always say that, you know, don't go into music unless you know, you, can, you don't want to do anything else. And for me, I needed that time to figure out, <laughs> to figure that out and explore. And I really, it, I pushed myself and gosh, I, I'm sure there are ways that I can't even you know, put into words how it affects my musical interpretation or my learning process. But I am sure, you know, that a broad education can only help the modern day artist. Well, and I think it's something you hear musicians say all the time is, I wish I had. I feel like half our the people Gleet and I have interviewed have said, you know, oh, I, I wish I would have um, taken a few more literature classes or had the opportunity to, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, pursue things that interest them now because in their youth they felt so pressured to just practice, 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 music, music, music all the time and not really foster those other parts of them as human beings. Right. Yeah, no, I feel really lucky. It was a great school for me. Um, can you tell us about some of your favorite things about studying with Laura Albeck? Oh, she was great. Um, 
She definitely always had very practical advice for me. The unique things she would have me do that other I haven't had other teachers do is she would make me play scales with her. We would trade off between playing first oboe and second oboe. So when I would I would follow her and her pitch, like it was that alone is such a great exercise. Can you actually describe that a little more? My my oh. inner pedagogue is like, ooh, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the lesson would open up with, um, yeah, we would play a scale, and she would say, okay, well, now, you know, we're going to play at the same time, scale simultaneously, and she's going to play as principal, and I as second, so, in a unison, so the second, I would learn to play quietly, and to listen, and to adjust as quickly as possible to her pitch, and then she would, and then she would switch, so that, then I would be, the leader. Yeah. It, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. That's totally brilliant. I'd never thought to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's little exercises like that, that she was really great at. Switching gears a little bit. You were very recently a finalist in the July Fox competition at IDRS this summer. Um, can you talk to us about your experience um, preparing for that and, um, yeah, how you prepared to kind of walk into one of the most renowned and known double read <laughs> performance venues? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I guess how it's did like you the deal with game. the pressure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oboe Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it was really such an honor to be there. It, I I was thrilled. I had never competed in an oboe competition before. So to be chosen as a finalist, it was really awesome. Um, the repertoire was great. It was all Baroque and 20th and 21st century pieces, which I feel like that's the kind of repertoire I relate to the most. And it was a luxury to have such a long stretch of time to really pour myself into it. I started preparing in January. Um, yeah, and on top of that, it was my first time attending an IDRS conference. So that wow. was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being surrounded by so much awesome oboe and bassoon players and to meet a few of my oboe heroes and hear them live. You know, Nancy Ambrose King, Peter Cooper, and Alex Klein were all there. So... Yeah, it was a super inspirational week, and it just made me so happy to be a part of this community. I can only imagine that there's a lot of performance anxiety that comes along with um, competing in that particular situation. Do you have hints or tips for how you combat performance anxiety? Mm, I think like a lot of things, it, it gets better with experience. Um but I don't think it will ever go away completely. I think it just means that we care about doing our best. I guess, you know, practical pointers that I've given myself, I, preparation, preparation is the key. You know, setting up mock auditions. And as like, you know, you get closer to the performance state, like do things to, I don't want to say torture yourself, but basically, <laughs> you know, like, I would take one of my worst reads and play through everything for myself without warming up, you know, just like mm -hmm. gritting through it. Um, I would make sure I could play the technically fast passages faster than I would need to. Um, and mentally, I don't know, I try to remove myself as much as I can, like focusing on playing with others or I'm focused on playing for the audience. You know, like it's not about me, it's about the music. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask about um, your newly won role in the L.A. Chamber Orchestra as principal oboe. And like you said, you were second oboe um, playing with Alan Vogel, who was also your teacher. Um, can you talk a little bit about that orchestra and um, taking over his legacy? It's been an incredible time. I mean, it's such an honor for me to be there. I I've looked up to Alan and I've looked up to the L.A. Chamber Orchestra for so long. And I got I had that CD that came out, I guess it out just 10 years ago, the, the Laco with uh, Hilary Hahn and Alan doing the rock mm. school concerto. Like, that's one of my all-time favorite recordings. Um, 
so yeah to be accepted into their musical family and we do we call it a family like everybody calls it this big family and you know to find that it's it's not only an ensemble of these amazing soloists but it's also a group of such wonderful people everyone seems so happy to be there and i just love that and they've continued to be so welcoming and friendly and I'm just thankful for all of their artistry because I think it inspires me to grow and to do my best. Um, on this podcast, we talk a lot about shine theory and how, you know, somebody close to you doing well makes you do well and everyone helps them, helps each other up to the top. And it sounds like the L.A. Chamber Orchestra does that. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, like they really shine for each other. That's really great. Um, what are some of your favorite pieces that you've performed with them? Hmm. Last season, where they were, it was so. At the beginning of last season, I was um, acting principal, and then just in October was the audition. It was a lot of great oboe heavy pieces from last season. It's right the first week after the audition happened, we did Beethoven's Third Symphony. We opened with Beethoven's mm-hmm. Seventh. Um, Mendelssohn Scottish Symphony. Oh my God! <laughs> it was yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it was awesome though. I mean, cause we spend so much time studying those pieces, and then to really put them into practice like that it was really thrilling. Um, I was just going to ask what your process is to study those works when you're getting ready to perform them. Mm-hmm. Sure, I definitely start out by listening to recordings. I give Elaine DuVos credit for her uh, orchestral repertoire class. She requires students to listen to three different recordings of an orchestra piece, taking notes, uh, taking notes of the metronome, the tempi. And I, I think it's such great advice that I continue to mm-hmm. use. You perform on period instruments, Baroque oboe, classical oboe. Um, I'm curious about... Um, what uh, ignited your interest in period instruments and uh, what their unique challenges and benefits are? It's been a lot of fun for me. I think I've always been really attracted to Baroque music, mostly because that's where a lot of our oboe chamber music repertoire comes from. Mm -hmm. So just seemed like a natural progression for me to be interested in the root of, you know, where our modern oboe comes from. Um, and everybody that I've talked to who pursues both modern and period instruments will tell me that, you know, the period instrument practice can only help the modern technique. You know, it certainly strengthens our ear training for pitch. Mm. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It literally forces you to hear the pitches, you know, more carefully that, you know, there's just so much more adjusting and more work to be done to get that instrument to play in tune in comparison to the modern advancements of our oboes mm-hmm. now. Um, it definitely makes me appreciate the modern. That's a very <laughs> nice way to put that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and, and then there's this whole other world of, style that has opened up to me that I've really appreciated. I love studying period instrument ensemble recordings. And yeah, it turns out in LA Chamber Orchestra, we perform a lot of Baroque and classical music on modern instruments, but um, Mm -hmm. I definitely think my understanding of those styles has been influenced since I've been studying historic performance practices. As a musician with a ton going on, um, how do you address things like work-life balance and self-care? I really appreciate my little breaks from the oboe. Um, I love my social life. I love my friends. I definitely need to check out sometimes and just go hang out with my friends and my husband and do things that have nothing to do with the oboe. It's, I just, it's good for me to check out for a little bit. And when I'm done, I'm refreshed and excited to go back to work. I make sure to go hear live music, uh, not necessarily classical concerts either. Um, We really love to go hear bluegrass bands or jazz concerts or electronic dance music. We have fun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And as for self-care, I 
uh, reading. Reading counts as self-care. I like to spend time reading, downtime reading. Um, I like to get outdoors any chance I get and go hiking and jogging, or I like to go to the gym. I I'd consider myself a fairly healthy person. I'm physically active. I enjoy food. I'm very conscious of healthy eating. I guess it's kind of a side effect of being in California for seven years. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, I definitely reward myself with good food. Um, my recent obsession has been poke. Have you guys heard of poke? It's like uh, is it's it like a Japanese? Sushi. It's from Hawaii, but yeah. It's oh, like, Hawaii. It's like I describe it as casual sushi, but it's like chipotle oh. sushi. You get it in a bowl of rice, and you get all these cool toppings. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I we don't have that. Enough way I get out to a poke <laughs> restaurant at least once a week. Like that's. <laughs> Yeah, we're in uh, Missouri and Mississippi, so we, we haven't – Pokey <laughs> hasn't made its way to us quite yet. <laughs> well, we're very jealous. It sounds really good. Yeah. We'll have to come visit sometime. I'm not going to I'll bring in all the Pokey joints. <laughs> Um, could you talk to us as a professional orchestral musician about your approach to read making, your routines, your habits, your philosophy as someone who, you know, I would imagine you have to have excellent reads on a pretty regular basis? I definitely make reads in big batches, but I will have a lot of reads at different stages ready to go. Um I found that I'm I'm not one of those read makers that can finish a read and go play on it that day. I definitely like to break my reads in over time. That's, I don't know, it's just my personal preference. What's some of the best advice you've ever gotten on read making? The idea that you have to make a laundry basket full of reads or you have to make a thousand yeah. reads before you, <laughs> before you start to know what you're doing. <laughs> I think, yeah, as much as we wish there was some shortcut, I, I don't think there is one it just takes time I first actually got to know who you are a little bit um, through social media because you have a really great Instagram and you're posting a lot of pictures um, from your life and videos of you playing and um, I would love to know what inspired you to reach out to the double read community uh, via social media sure thanks <laughs> um I don't know. I To me, it's just been another venue to perform in. Um, mm-hmm. I'm able to share my work with a different audience. You know, it's a bigger audience, too. Um, it's not just recordings. You know, yeah, it's, it's pictures and my stupid, nerdy oboe humor, and I have fun with it. <laughs> um, and it's been really great because I, I get a lot of messages from oboists from around the world, um, a lot of them just saying hi or they'll ask me questions or they'll say something on my page really inspired them. And it's just really sweet. Um, I love hearing from people. I feel like it's a simple way for me to contribute something to the oboe community. Do you have um, a warm-up habit or skill system that you use? Like, Are your practice sessions structured in any particular way? Hmm. Yes, for my warm up, if I'm warming up at a rehearsal or a recording session, I definitely am conscious of making sure to do it in a way that's efficient and that won't annoy my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I don't know. It's yeah, I warm up in a way that I make sure I know what the read is up to and long tones. I don't know. <laughs> I love to ask this question. Um, what would you say? to a younger version of yourself? I am very grateful for the way things have worked out. So I don't know if I would want to interfere with anything. Um, But I guess if I could tell myself one thing, it would be to have more patience, a little more patience with the orchestral audition process, a little more patience with, especially with reads. I mean, reads, that's just, it takes time. And I put in the time, but... (laughs) I think I wish I could have felt a little better about, you know, having a little more patience with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of my favorite questions to ask is about a favorite memory of a past performance that you have that stands out in your mind. The one that sticks out to me was 
technically my first outreach kind of concert. Um, it was at Bard College, and our school orchestra was brought into a maximum security prison. <gasps> We played Dvorak's New World Symphony. I played the English horn solo for the first time uh, for a bunch of prisoners. And uh, the auditorium was super packed. It was, and they were, these guys were one of the most enthusiastic audiences I've ever played for. Like, they gave us standing ovations after every movement. Um, it was just obvious how they were definitely moved. They were so appreciative. And it was so moving for me. I mean, you know, looking back, it sounds silly for me to say it out loud. You know, of course we know that music has the power to break down barriers, mm -hmm. but for me to feel it firsthand like that was really unforgettable. What was the wow. energy like going into that? Was because you were students as well. Were people like nervous or? Yeah, I mean, it was super weird. Like you never think about what it's like to be there, right? It's a completely different world that I would have not had had any other experience with. Um, and oh, I also remember we were going in and, and the men had a uh, the, oper the option to either go to our concert or there was also some, I think it was a baseball game that was on TV at the same time. Um, so I was thinking, oh gosh, like... <laughs> Nobody's going to come to our concert, you know. <laughs> but I was so wrong. <laughs> good good thing. Like, it was great. Wow, that's that's intense. That sounds really intense. What were your emotions as you were playing the Dvorak New World Symphony for that audience? Yeah, I mean, it was it was all really moving. Um, it was part of uh, – so Bard has this prison, prison initiative – program where students and Bard faculty go into the prison and teach courses. Um, and if they keep up with it long enough, they can get a degree, a college degree. So it was part of that program. I think that program is doing really well. That is amazing. That's yeah. really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You think about the message of the going home and the English horn solo and everything. Mm -hmm. That's just, I know. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What advice would you give to people who aspire to have a career like yours? I do recommend going to college or a university um, and getting a broad education out of your undergraduate experience and exploring your interests. It's I think it's a good way to make sure you want to go into music and it's a great way to enrich your life. I think college is the best way to test your interests. Um, and for people who might be at a conservatory who are listening, um, I recommend reading books that are outside of your curriculum. You know, push yourself in things outside of music and explore. Uh, where do you look to for inspiration? Um, I mean, some people will interpret this as like literal oboists and that's totally fine too but we always love to hear about you know if there are books or documentaries or something that people find to really get their motor running when I don't know for me at least inspiration is really you know plateaus and peaks and valleys and that type of thing do you have a source of inspiration you can shout out mm, I mean yeah I definitely turn to recordings for musical inspiration i I treat myself with the uh, Berlin Digital Concert Hall subscription because mm. it doesn't get better than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, Alan Vogel is still, I still look to him for advice and inspiration. He's, he's one of the first people I'll call. He's always been there for me. Um, I love going to hear live music. Like I said, you know, it doesn't have to be just classical and bluegrass or jazz. Um, and I really love going to hear my musician friends perform. You know, their hard work and talent always inspires me. What are some of your favorite non-classical groups? Some of my favorite music to listen to. Like, I'll, I'll, I love Nina Simone and Ella Fitzgerald, you know, classic jazz standard stuff. Um but I, I also love listening to early Baroque stuff. I've re recently really been digging um, this viol player, Jordi Saval. Um, I love him. Yeah. <laughs> What's not to love? <laughs> uh -huh. um, 
it, it, it varies. Um, do you have any exciting upcoming performances in your next season with Laco? Actually, I'm really excited about the first concert. We're playing along with the movie Amadeus. That's, That's awesome. It's going to be really fun. Um, <laughs> doing the Brandenburg Concertos. Um, I'm really stoked to play the Stravinsky Pulcinella Suite. Um, is there any piece that you haven't gotten to play? And I guess this could be solo chamber or orchestral. Like, uh, what piece have you, have you always wanted to play that you haven't gotten to yet? Mahler, Das Lied von der Erde. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's been a favorite of mine. Can you tell us um, what your favorite music to play is? Well, anything by Bach. Anything by Stravinsky, uh, you know, like, I, I can't wait to play Stravinsky's Pulcinella Suite this season. Yeah. Um, the Prokofiev Quintet is probably my favorite chamber music piece to play. And I really love our Poulenc repertoire. Oh, and speaking of Poulenc, <laughs> which one of you guys came up with the Poulenc Trio dubstep mashup for the intro of your podcast? Obviously, that was Jackie. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I am so glad to hear you say that because the, a couple of weeks ago, Galit was like, do you think people know what it is? Like, do you think it goes over people's heads? And I was like, I don't think so. Because no. <laughs> last month I went to hear someone perform it. And of course, the opening and then it like kept going like it's supposed to. And I was like, hmm, where's the, where's the dubstep? So... <laughs> wrong <laughs> something's missing <laughs> that's amazing no, that was that was obviously jackie <laughs> i could not come up with anything that funny <laughs> well this has been such a cool and fun chat um when our listeners want to follow up with you where can they find you on the internet i have a website i and then on social media on Facebook, uh, but I'm mostly active. I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, my handle is Obo Jones, but I think if you look up my name, you can also find me. And what's your website address? We'll link to it in the episode description as well. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's my name, ClaireBrazo.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and best of luck with Pulcinella and everything else. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much. <laughs> So we hope you enjoyed that interview. If you like what you heard, do not forget to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Double Read Dish. You can listen to past episodes on iTunes, Google Play, our website, DoubleReadDish.com, or on our YouTube channel. Next episode, we are so excited to um, present an interview with Ula Christian Dahl, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.